The Johns Hopkins Science Review, presented by the Johns Hopkins University and station WAAM in Baltimore. To Mr. Lynn Poole of the Johns Hopkins University, hearty congratulations on completion of the third year of your Science Review television program. Assure you that Science Review holds high place on our list of recommended TV programs and is widely used in science classes. Best wishes for your continued success. Signed, Harold C. Hunt, General Superintendent, Chicago Public Schools. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another Johns Hopkins Science Review. It's really a great evening for us down here in Baltimore because, you, as you know, we're celebrating our third anniversary. Our program started in March 1948. We begin our fourth year with a lot of hope that we're going to be able to bring you very worthwhile and interesting programs. And we're very happy tonight, too. This telegram and many others we've received from friends all over the country. I'd like to show you some of them, or read some of them to you. Uh, this telegram we're very proud to have. It's from Dr. Earl J. McGrath, the Commissioner of Education for the United States, who says congratulations to the Johns Hopkins Science Review upon the celebration of its third anniversary of educational programming on the air, and our best wishes for the continuation of this outstanding educational service throughout the fourth and succeeding years. We don't have time to read them all to you, but here's a telegram we're very proud of. It's from Dr. Alan B. Dumont, the head of the Dumont Laboratories and the Network, congratulating the program and station WAM for its wonderful service in bringing this program to the people. Uh, here's a, pro here's a uh, telegram from William Jansen, superintendent of schools of the city of New York. And another one from Dr. Korma Maury, the president of the National Education Association, headquartered down in Washington, D.C. A, a telegram from uh, Frank Schreiber, the manager of WGN-TV in Chicago, and we have other telegrams from the stations along the networks. Here's one from Mortimer W. Lowy, who is the director of the Dumont Television Network in New York City, who sends his congratulations and says that the Dumont Network is happy to be able to work with WAM and the Johns Hopkins University in presenting this program to you. There are others we have back here and some letters from you people out there who happen to read in the newspaper that this was our third anniversary. We thank you for these messages and we pledge that we will continue through, we hope, succeeding and many years to bring you the Johns Hopkins Science Review to the very best of our ability. But let's on with the show tonight. But I'd first like you to see the flowers that we have here for our anniversary from the management and the staff of WAAM to help us celebrate this beginning of the fourth year. Now tonight, we want to answer the question and show you why, under certain circumstances, people say, don't drink that water. The problem of water purification and the disposal of sewage is a problem the sanitary engineer takes care of uh, for us and the, is a problem that keeps us in good health. The science of sanitary engineering is one which requires great skill and knowledge, combining many different fields of science. Now tonight, we want you to show, uh, to see how sanitary engineering protects my life and yours. Our first guest, is Dr. Abel Wallman, Chairman of the Department of Sanitary Engineering at Johns Hopkins University. Now, Dr. Wallman serves us both here and abroad, and there are few men that are better qualified to tell us about the science of sanitary engineering because he's been a pioneer in the field and was one of the first men to use the chlorination of water to purify it and keep us in good health. It's my honor to present Dr. Wallman. Thank you very much, Mr. Poole. To tell the full story of man's eternal search for pure water, I would have to start somewhere back about the dawn of history. 
perhaps a quotation from an early Sanskrit document on medical lore, written about 4,000 years ago, is appropriate in this particular session. It's good to keep water in copper vessels, it says, to expose them to sunlight and to filter it through charcoal. Today we use copper salts in many of our storage reservoirs to control plants in general. We still use, of course, the beneficent values of sunlight in contributing to the purification of these same reservoirs. The use of charcoal in many instances remains today the best means we have for removing the taste and odor compounds which are frequently encountered in water. This story of the search for pure water would run continuously up through the centuries to the present time. It would relate how the Egyptians used chemical precipitation and sedimentation to clarify their water, how the Romans built great aqueducts to reach beyond the densely settled areas for sources of pure water, how the need for pure water and ways to get it were forgotten for many centuries during the Middle Ages and Europeans turned to both beer and wine in order to avoid drinking the much more dangerous water. And finally, how as recently as the last century, the imperative need for pure water again became recognized and the art of water purification was rediscovered. In this book which I have in front of me, written by a friend of mine a few years ago, we find a record of the dismal beginning of this new search for pure water some six or eight decades ago. As late summer approached each year, typhoid fever and other waterborne diseases rose from the smoldering fires to conflagration in most of the American towns and cities and in most of the towns and cities throughout the world. The myriads of typhoid bacteria from the sick were put back into the rivers through the sewers and they were again consumed by the people in downstream communities. Water spread this fire from place to place and in this microscopic film you will get some impression of the kinds of materials uh, that were used and prevail in most surface bodies of water. Most of what you're looking at at this moment on this film would represent silt and inert material and many of the moving <coughs> microorganisms uh, have been also discovered over many years and purification processes have been designed uh, to remove uh, most of them. Many of them are free swimming. A great many of them are attached either to the silt or to the bottoms and sides of your flowing streams and virtually all of them <coughs> are invisible uh, to the naked eye. That is one of the dangers involved in drinking surface waters uh, which uh, hold a great many of invisible materials, living and inert, uh, all of which, however, must be removed in order to protect uh, the lives of the drinking uh, public. Although filtration of water had been practiced since ancient times at various places in the world, it was not until the middle of the 19th century that a few medical men and engineers realized that filtration did more than clarify the water, that it actually removed the living germs of deadly diseases. Not until the 1890s, however, were most of the skeptics convinced of this fact. Soon then, an increasingly informed public opinion demanded protection from waterborne diseases. As a result of this, there was an astonishingly rapid increase in the installation of equipment and plants that filtered water. This increase was accompanied by an equally remarkable and dramatic decline in the sickness and the death resulting from typhoid fever. Shortly after 1900 it was discovered that chlorine was a reliable, practical and safe chemical to use to kill waterborne bacteria. Towns that filtered their water began also to chlorinate it. Other towns that could not afford filters or considered their spring or well supply did not need purification began to use chlorine for similar accidental contamination against these living organisms. Typhoid rates continued their sharp decline. This is illustrated by only one of many charts 
that graphically tell this tale. On the left side of the chart, the lines represent deaths from typhoid fever. The lines on the right side represent the percent of the population furnished with purified water. Note that as the percentage on the right increases, the number of deaths from typhoid dwindles to about two a year. All the result of a pure water supply. As a result of these accomplishments, supplemented by other sanitary measures, typhoid fever has nearly vanished now from our population. The barriers are now so numerous and the sources of the disease so few that the fire is almost dead in most American communities. As this recent history is gradually forgotten by the public mind, and most of this is taken for granted, the maintenance of these barriers becomes an even greater responsibility of public health officials. In order to illustrate in somewhat greater detail what I've been talking about, we have set up here tonight a model filtration plant which is now in operation. The processes are used that are typical of most water filtration plants purifying the water which reaches your home right at this moment. Dr. Geyer, one of my associates in sanitary engineering at the Johns Hopkins Engineering School, will take you through this plant, explaining the way in which the present state of the art of, your, of water purification protects the general public. We will <coughs> show you how water is purified so that it's safe to drink when you draw it from the faucet in your home. The model plant here is working just like dozens of filler plants are purifying water for you throughout the United States. The uh, turbid river water is flowing from this jar into a chemical treatment and coagulation system through a sedimentation basin where it is held into a filter through which it passes into a clear well for final chemical treatment and ultimately goes out into the distribution systems for use by you. We'll look at this process more in detail. It was developed some 50 years ago for the purification of turbid waters in American streams, such as the water from the Gunpowder Falls here at Baltimore. In the rapid mixing basin, a chemical coagulant known as alum, aluminum sulfate, is added to the water and mixed rapidly with it. This chemical forms a gelatinous precipitate which enmeshes the bacteria and the suspended matter in the mixer. It then flows over into a flocculator where the slow motion of the water and the flock gives added time for the entrapment of suspended matter. From the flocculator, the water moves into the settling basin where the weight of the flock and the entrapped material causes it to settle. In full-size plants, these basins usually hold the water for two to eight hours. But even if sedimentation is for a longer period, some of the flock is carried across into the filter. It is this flock caught on the surface of the filter that makes it work. The water passes slowly down through the sand filter out into a clear well. When the filter is clean, water would run through too fast if it were not for an automatic valve or rate controller which holds it at a steady pace. These filters will run for two or three days before they become so clogged that washing is necessary. In order to wash the filter, the settled water valve is closed, the filtered water valve is closed, a drain valve is opened to permit the escape of the dirt, and filtered water is forced upward through the sand. The sand rises in this upward stream of water and the sand drains are cleaned by dancing in a suspended form of animation. Filters are usually washed for about five minutes before putting them back into service. To return the filter to service, 
the wash water is turned off, the drain is closed, the filter stand settles back in place, Settled water, the settled water valve is then opened and the filtered water valve opened to replace the filter in operation. After filtration, the water is collected in a clear well where it is treated with lime to reduce its acidity in order to prevent corrosion of your plumbing systems and by chlorine to kill any bacteria that may have escaped the sedimentation and filtration process and assure you of a continuously safe water to drink. We can see uh, what coagulation, sedimentation, and filtration does by observing these bottles. The first is the turbid river water. The second is the coagulated water with the flock settled at the bottom and some small amount of flock still in suspension. And finally, the clarified filtered effluent which has been chlorinated and is ready to drink. Now that we've had the opportunity of seeing this miniature filtration plant and to see how our water is purified for the use in our home, let's take a look at a film which shows us again in an animated form how the water flows perhaps from a dirty river on through the filtration plant until it reaches our home. A river, lake, or any other body of fresh water may serve as the source of the raw water supply. The water is first drawn through a screen in the greenhouse to exclude fish and sticks, leaves, and other floating matter. Through an intake pipe, the water is carried to a low lift pump, which discharges it into the mixing chamber. Here the coagulating chemicals are added. The agitators thoroughly mix these chemicals with the water and the sticky gelatinous precipitate is formed. In the adjoining flocculators, large paddle wheels agitate this mass and cause it to coagulate into clumps or flock. The flocks absorb most of the color in the water and entangle mud and bacteria and suspended matter. From this chamber, the water passes into the sedimentation basin. The velocity is reduced and the flock slowly settles to the bottom of the basin, carrying with it most of the impurities in the water. This sediment may be removed by scrapper mechanisms installed for this purpose. Here we see the water going to the filter bed, where it is strained through the sand bed and is then sent to the clear water reservoir. Water in this process is forced up through the sand, and thus cleans the bottom of the bed. By using this washing process, the same bed of sand and gravel may be used over and over again. As the water leaves this clear water basin, the chlorine is added. Once in the reservoir, the water is drawn up through a suction line by high lift pumps, which deliver it to the distribution system which carries it to the many points of use in homes, offices, factories, and hospitals, to all of the outlets so familiar to us all. It's evident to every one of us that the science of sanitary engineering and the purification of water over this entire country is of vital importance to us every time we turn on a tap in our homes. But there's another problem that the sanitary engineer deals with, and that's the problem of sewage. When the water has been used in a large city or even a small city, it's muddied and dirtied and filled with waste products. So the sanitary engineer comes to work again, and I'm going to ask Dr. Wollman to tell you how the sewage disposal purification plants work in our cities. The sanitary engineer creates problems for himself on occasion. You've seen how he purifies water. Then that water is used, of course, in modern sewage systems in order to carry off the normal wastes of ordinary living in every community in this country. We're familiar with all of the water closets, tubs, sinks and floor drains, which are the devices for making the solution and suspension of wastewater, which we call the spent water or the sewage. After collecting these wastes into sewer pipes, which are of course invisible to most of the population, the sewage must eventually be removed from the carrying water. 
The act of removing the waste from the carrying water is called sewage treatment. It is carried out in a sewage treatment plant. The processes of unloading the waste call for many complex procedures. The sewage water must undergo many changes before it's safe to return to the source from which it originally came. If the water is not pure, when it is again discharged into the receiving stream, the water of that stream will be polluted, and the health of the downstream communities may again be endangered. You will see now, in model form, a sewage treatment plant. You will be led through its processes by Mr. Cruze, another one of our associates in sanitary engineering at the School of Hygiene and Public Health. We have set up here a model of a complete sewage treatment plant that could be used for a small community. The sewage is collected in the city mains and are conducted to the plant reaching at this point where it passes through the primary process on through to the secondary process and finally is discharged to the receiving stream or body of water. The essential parts of this plant are as follows. The sewage enters the plant through a rough coarse bar screen where floating materials such as rags, paper, leaves, and sticks are removed. The screens must be raked manually or mechanically, and the screenings are buried or burned. In some installations, they are actually ground up mechanically and reintroduced into the sewage to be subsequently removed throughout the process. The next unit, is called an Imhoff tank. It is a two-story basin. The upper compartment or sedimentation chamber is a V-shaped hopper tank with a slotted bottom. The retention period or the time of flow from here to there is approximately two hours. The large solids, organic in nature, are allowed to pass through the slot into the first story of the tank, which is known as the sludge digestion chamber. The accumulated sludge undergoes anaerobic decomposition, and the gases and the slimes and scums pass upward into these two chambers, which are known as gas vents. The accumulated sludge is removed once or twice a year onto sludge drying beds where the sun and the wind and the draining effect of the sand beds make a inoffensive black granular material such as you see here. It has fertilizer value and is an excellent soil conditioner for gardens and lawns. The settled sewage next passes into a dosing chamber, which automatically and intermittently feeds water to the biofilter. The biofilter is a thick bed of stones over which the sewage is distributed either by rotary arms or by spray nozzles. As the sewage passes over the surface of the stones, a gelatinous, slimy, organic film is formed. This film is literally teeming with thousands of biological forms, and they possess the remarkable property of being able to remove colloidal and soluble matter from the sewage. These little organisms use this waste material as food and return it to the water as breakdown components that are harmless sulfates, nitrates, and carbon dioxide. Now the effluent from the biofilter passes into a final sedimentation basin where the effluent receives a finer polish and is principally for the reason of removing any sloughing material that occasionally comes from the biological films. 
As you can see, the effluent is considerably clearer between 70 and 90 percent of the suspended matter have been removed and between 90 and 95 percent of the bacteria have been removed. This high degree of purification is largely due to our fascinating little organisms located on the stones of the biofilter. Now that we've seen this model, let's take a look at another animated film to show how the sewage works in our cities. Water enters the home and commercial establishments through the tap and finally gurgles down the drain, carrying with it the wastes of life and living. Contained in sewage are three types of dangerous matter, suspended or visible solids which float on the stream into which they are discharged or settle in shoals on the banks and bottom of the stream. Two, dissolved organic matter which decomposes and produces putrefaction in these streams. And three, bacteria which might spread disease. The function of the sewage treatment plant is to remove and modify these three components of sewage and to render the waste liquid harmless. Collected by a network of sewers, sewage is delivered to a treatment plant for elimination of the dangerous matter. First, the coarse solids are drained and strained out of the water. Then we see the water slacken in velocity and the heavy matter settle. A great bulk of suspended solids is removed by settling in large tanks where the velocity is reduced so that the solids fall out of the liquid. This process is very much like muddy water settling in a glass. Scrapper mechanisms periodically remove this sludge from the tank. After having removed the suspended solids from the sewage, a greater degree of purifaction is obtained by oxidizing the organic matter. This may be done on a trickling filter, a bed of rough, hard material on which the sewage is sprayed and allowed to trickle through in contact with the air. After the sewage has been treated in this matter, it is clarified in a final settling tank. The result is a clear liquid which flows from the tank to the outflow. Before discharging the water into a stream which may serve as a water supply, bathing beach or shellfish breeding area, chlorine is added to destroy practically all of the bacteria contained in this remaining liquid. For the Dumont Television Network. This is the Dumont Television Network. You can save for your future today the United States Savings Bond way. are one of the surest.